Okay, so on the agenda for today is two things. Number one, because we had that last minute um, delving into the Ramos 14 Klalim uh, for counting mitos, and I, uh, I hadn't prepared it, and I kind of like ran through it. I just wanted to go through it one more time. I brought the English with me just to make sure that I got the correct translations of these things. And I also have like a derech that I think we should dabble in to understand these in line with Ramam's uh, critique of the Bahag. And I just want to demonstrate what the derech might look like, even though we're not going to flesh it out in full. Okay, that sounds really abstract, but uh, I'll show you uh, I'll show you what I mean in a second. So let's start off. I'm just going to... Uh, uh, wait, what again? Yeah. Uh, is it necessary to go over the rules for the Sekhardic Post in order to understand more about the Mishnah Torah? Yeah, so th that's kind of what I, I, I speculated about yesterday, that, that clearly he holds it's important uh, in order to properly understand Torah, as he says in the Hotam to the Sefer Mitzvos, but clearly he doesn't hold it's important enough to, for him to have included it in the, in the Mishnah Torah, you know? Right. Like, and even to the point where, you know, what he could have done is he could have just, in the same way that in the Sefer Mitzvos he has a, a treatment of every mitzvah, and then in the Mishnah Torah he just has a stam one-liner, he could have put these as a one-liner in the uh, in the Mishnah Torah, and he didn't, you know. Right. So, like, maybe we should think about that for a little while. Is like, like, what, what do we make of that? Like, he was so harsh about, you know, the if you don't understand what a mitzvah is, then it's like a sealed book. And yet he and, and he wrote he literally wrote a whole book in order to rectify that problem. Uh, and yet he doesn't uh, he doesn't incorporate that into the Mishnah Torah at all. Yeah. Is that, do you think that he holds that that idea of um, that you're kind of like obligated to understand how the system fits together and all that, um, in a sense, is like more of a Okay, yeah, that's a good possibility. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so, so for the Chachamim who are engaged in the study of mitzvot, then this is necessary. And I guess for the people, like you said yesterday, like people who will challenge the Rambam's authority simply on the basis of the fact that he goes against other what other Chachamim said. It's necessary for that, um, but it's not an endeavor that's necessary for the Hamon. And I think I can back that up with some uh, reasoning, which is like, let's say you had a, um, a similar problem in the realm of medicine. Like oh, the example I was giving yesterday, let's say like the bodily organs and such, right? So like, let's say you had a, a, a generation of Chachamim who completely had no grasp of what is a fundamental of medicine uh, and what is like a particular or like what's not, you know? So you would definitely need to correct that. And for the Fahamim who are operating under that error, you need to show them how they're wrong and the reasoning for the right ways. But when you're writing a medicine book, like a, a medical book for the Hamon, or if you're prescribing medication, then there's absolutely no need to go into like well, you see, you think that the gallbladder's job is to like regulate brain juice, you know? And like, I wanna show you why all the assumptions about that are wrong and how like the gallbladder and the brain are, you know, you just, you just give them the, the, the brain juice or not, I just, you, know, you just, you know, you just give them the right medicine, you know? So like, I, I feel like that might be, I think that's a, that is a good theory. I think like for the Hamon, the reality is when they learn the Mishnah Torah, they're getting halachos presented in accordance with the correct idea of mitzvos. So they'll absorb a certain amount through osmosis from the fact that the Ram doesn't count their abundance, from the fact that he doesn't count, you know, things that are kola, kola, tar, kula. Um, and the only, there's no need for the purposes of the Mishnah Torah to explain why those Chachamim were wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Did that answer your question, Chaim? Uh, yes. Is that, uh, I guess, with a further, uh, further lingering doubt? <laughs> well, I his it, it, it seems like there are more unrelated Svarim at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is weird, right? Because he introduces it as though his intent was to write the Mishnah Torah, and then he was forced to write this book in order to produce the list right. at the beginning of the but, Mishnah Torah. So I, so my, I, my is, I don't see why he had to write the Sefer of it. Was, so it, it seems like he wanted, it, like, I wanted to write the Mishnah Torah, but I couldn't do that until I wrote Right. In other words, like, like according to what we've reasoned out so far from yesterday, he could have just written a pamphlet with this Hakdama and the Shurashim and not right. written the Sefer Mitzvahs. Is that? Yeah. 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 That's a good question. Right. And especially when he says that the only explanation he's going to give to the Mitzvahs is not for Dinim, but in order so you know 
uh, I'll pierce our shame. I'll dare pierce our shame, what the mitzvah refers to, you know? So the question is like, what's the use of that? If you're already going to have a book with all the mitzvahs, and if you've, if you've clarified what the, the rules are, you know, for what you count as a mitzvah. I mean, my, I'll, my first inclination is to say, and this is just an inclination, is like, it's one thing to uh, speak in abstract about what counts as a mitzvah, but to see how that system plays out, like, you know, is, uh, is another matter. But then my, the other part of me says, well, wouldn't you see that in the Mishnah Torah anyway? No, maybe the Sefer Mitzvah is the abstract. That's the abstract. Uh-huh. Like, what is the, if it was going to be, if I talk about leaving the world, I mean. Right. So then, but I guess just to push that question a little further, apparently you don't need that treatment of the Mitzvahs in the Mishnah Torah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so that's why I'm assuming it's connected to his endeavor of, like, clarifying what a Mitzvah is. Um, as, as opposed to clarifying, like, what the... So again, like, okay, let me just start from the beginning again, right? So Mishnah Torah is a book of dinim. Sefer Mitzvah is a book clarifying what a mitzvah is. So what I'm theorizing is why is he, so we understand why he has to write the Shirashim. Why, and we understand why he has to list the mitzvahs. Why does he have to go and have a, an entire paragraph in every mitzvah? And what I'm saying is maybe that seeing the full expression of those 14 rules in a full set of Taryag as a theoretical matter is necessary in order to like completely understand that system to understand what a mitzvah really is not for the sake of practice which is why he doesn't include the shame the safer mitzvahs paragraphs in the mishnah torah but in order to fully flesh out like a system of uh, of the 14 shirashim you're going to just have one line that you wouldn't know like exactly what it's yeah exactly like it, it's like uh you know uh if you um I'm trying to think of an analogy here Like, I mean, this is a bad analogy. Like, let's say, like, I'm, I'm a lot better at coming up with bad analogies than good analogies, so I'll say the bad analogy. Uh, like, if you define what a malacha is, and then you said, and here's the 39, you just listed the names, I feel like you would not, even if you had a very clear, precise definition, you wouldn't really see, the mind wouldn't grasp, like, how that definition expresses itself in 39 categories. So there's a value in doing that, even if you're not taking it to the full extent of showing how it translates into halakha lamaisa, you know? Um, and so I feel like that's what he's doing with the Sefer Mitzvahs. But again, I, I also have not learned the Sefer Mitzvahs as much as the Mishnah Torah, so I, I don't know, like, if, if what I'm saying plays out. Right, right. Yeah. Should we change this to the Sefer Mitzvahs here? Haha, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, maybe, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you guys say? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think the best, it's truthfully, the best solution would be yeah. is if we take that Rabbi Zucker plan that I mentioned, which is anytime we encounter a new mitzvah, we'll anchor ourselves in the Mishnah Torah. But anytime we encounter a new mitzvah, we'll read the um, the the presentation in the Sefer Mitzvahs, the Minyan Mitzvahs, Stam thing, the Koseras, and then the and then learn the Halavas. And I think that way we'll like you know, get the best of both worlds without, like, devoting uh, a whole year to just say from the toast. Right. Yeah. What do you guys think? Any uh, any other thoughts or questions on on, uh, on this? No, no, Okay. All right, so let's... I have, I have a question. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, Reb Pesach, on his shir on, I think, yeah, I think it was a Sunday, said that you, one of the reasons that you've learned the understanding the mitzvahs allows you to do the, the mitzvahs pro allows you to do a proper tshuva. Allows yeah. you to do the mitzvahs properly. So what? It, so why would the Rambam make the them into two separate books if you wouldn't be able to understand the mitzvahs properly? It was just yeah. for practice. Yeah. So this is a question we're going to have to confront uh, when we learn. Okay. Uh, there. Okay. Let me, let me uh, back up to pre pre when we did this year. So my original plan. I think I might have told you some of this when we were talking about yeshiva schedules is I kind of wanted to go through every place in the Rambam's writings, Bichlal, where he talks about what he wants to do with the Mishnah Torah. And in the end, I decided to just do the Sefer Mitzvot and the Mishnah Torah. But one of the questions that, he, that comes up is, let's say, how, how necessary is it and for what purpose to understand the, the derivations and origins of the mitzvah in order to do the mitzvah? Okay, in other words, let's say, for example, in, in this yeshiva, we place a premium on, 
on going through the sugyos and and like you end up with a different asiyas and mitzvah in light of your understanding of all the shaklavataria, all the rejected shitos, all the derivations and stuff. And uh, and it seems like the Ramam definitely valued that as a study. Like he says, you should do that in Hilkos Talmud Torah. But the question is, for the sake of knowing how to do the mitzvah, how important was that? Um, and uh, and it seems like he kind of leans to the side of it's not as important. You know, like there are, there are statements he makes where he says like, that there are people who spend all their time in the Shakla Vitaria of the Gemara, and they don't understand that that wasn't the purpose of why they did the Shakla Vitaria. The purpose of the Shakla Vitaria was to end up with the Halakha. So if you go back and look at all the Shakla Vitaria, like he doesn't call it a waste of time, but like he talks about it as though that's not the best use of your time, you know? Um, and uh, and so, so the question, like in terms of uh, uh, that you're posing to me here, is like, you know, to what extent is a person's Asiyah and Mitzvah complete if he only had the information in the Mishnah Torah? How would that Asiyah and Mitzvah be different if he had the explanation in the Sefer Mitzvahs? And then I'm kind of adding to that. And then what does it do when you learn the Halakha inside and out and like how everything is derived and where everything comes from? Does Is that just for the purpose of Talmud Torah, passing on the Masorah, Ahav Hashem? Or does that actually affect your Asiyah and Mitzvah? And if so, in what way? And if, and and like and in, and in given that, like why did he divide his books this way? So I guess I didn't answer your question. I'm just kind of like questioning it, you know? What was that about, um, about um, learning the Shachal Vitaria? Um, let, me, let me read to you the actual phrase so I don't paraphrase here. Um, in the Gemara? Um, I guess because they did have a responsibility to... Halakha Masa doesn't mean things that you can implement now. It's, uh, but, but to know like, what, the, what the final Halakha is. Um, let me just stop sharing and then share this document again. So this is a document I have in, in progress right now of, uh, I call it Statements of Purpose, which is all the places where the Ramam talks about his purpose <laughs> in, uh, in, 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 in his works. Um, and some of this is my translation, some of it I just got from, uh, from various books. Um, so hold on, I'm just going to find the statement that I was talking about. Oh, here we go. I think this is it. Letter to Rav Yosef. I think this is Rav Yosef, Rav Yehuda, who, uh, anyone know, anyone know how, uh, what, what was special about that student? I think that's his name. I mean, I, I'm going to embarrass myself. Hold on. Let me, let me make sure. Yeah. I'm kind of yeah. getting, um, he's the one who asked who the Mishnah Torah was addressed to? Not the Mishnah Torah. That's not what you meant, right? But no, I meant Mornivukim. Mornivukim, yeah, right. Okay, right. That, that's what I thought. That's, yeah, Rav Yosef, Rav Yehuda. Is that true? Uh, I'm trying to look in my name sounds right to me, but I, I really don't know. Yeah, I know. They all, all the names sound the same. Like, the same, same reason I, I get all the, the Ibn Tibbins, uh, Ibn Tibbins mixed up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, know his name, I know his name was Yosef. Okay, yeah, I also know his name was Yosef. Uh, Rav Yosef, Rav Yehuda. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, okay, so I think this is the same Rav Yosef. So he says, um, oh, this is what I referenced uh, yesterday. I have decreed that you not slacken your efforts until you comprehend the code in its entirety. Make it your book par excellence and teach it everywhere in order that its usefulness should be enhanced. For the desired goal in all uh, the material which was collected in the Talmud is destroyed and lost. And the intention of scholars is a waste of time in studying the deliberations of the Talmud. Oh, he does say waste of time. <laughs> this is not my translation. I think I got this from... Isidore Tversky's book, Mishnah Torah, which I'm rereading now, um, which is, uh, I think it's an academic dissertation on the Mishnah Torah. So uh, let me read that again for dramatic sake. And the intention of scholars is a waste of time in studying the deliberations in the Talmud, as if the intention and goal is, is expertise in matters of controversy and nothing else. Indeed, this is not the primary objective. On the contrary, the deliberations and the debate came about only accidentally because there emerged ambiguous statements which one scholar explained in a certain way, while his colleague came and explained it in the opposite way, and each one saw a need to elucidate his way of reasoning, which supports his view, in order that his explanation may prevail. The main intention is none other than to make known that which man is obligated to do, and that from which he must refrain. This is clear to someone like yourself. Therefore, I have emphasized the main goal, to facilitate its memorization, and more than this, to make it known altogether, for it had already been lost amongst all the words of debate. And I have left everything else, i.e. the Talmudic deliberations, to the one who chooses to make this his expertise, and all the more so for one who not only thinks this is this to be a subject of expertise, but one who thinks that this is the ultimate goal and objective uh, through which he will become great in the, and which he ought to seek. So he's dividing people into three categories, right? There's people who, who 
focus on what they're supposed to, according to the Quran, which is to know what to do and what not to do. Then there's people who, who relate to the deliberations and discussions in the Talmud as something that one can choose to become an expert in. Uh, and like it's an interest of theirs. And then there are people who think that that is the main goal. And that seems to be furthest removed from the truth according to the Ramam. Yeah. So this, again, this is like, uh, you know, I think this is definitely something that that is not agreed upon by everyone. I mean, just if you look at yeshivas nowadays, you know, especially Ashkenazi yeshivas, the vast majority of time is spent in the deliberations and the Shakla Bataria and all that stuff. And and uh, few people take that and, and, and go down to the Halakh Lamaisa, you know, from their Gemara. Like to them, Halakh Lamaisa is one study and like Gemara is another study. Um, and... Uh, People are certainly not deriving halakha from, from their study of the Gemaras, you know, that's just not a common practice. I mean, I think I've heard in Spartak yeshivas that's much more of a of a thing uh, going way, way back. Um, but it's definitely not, not the case in Ashkenazic yeshivas. And then that's also, um, and then certainly not in areas that we don't practice. Like, you know, let's say like you might find people who, who learn through, you know, Sugis and Kulin about Kashrus and trace it down to the practical halakha. Not that many people in there in Kutchen, you know. If they learn it at all, like they're just learning it purely for the theoretical theoretics. Yeah, it's weird. Like, you could, I mean, what does it mean to learn for the theoretics? Because if you kind of get to the actual halacha, even though like you're not going to practice it, is that still theoretical? Right. Um, so it sounds like from the, I mean, we're going to read this in depth later on, but it sounds like from the, what Ramam is saying is that if you did not have a Mishnah Torah then you would have to go through the theoretical and wade through it in order to try to extract the practical from it, which would necessitate going through a lot of stuff that ultimately would end up not having a bearing on your, on your, uh, on your Pesach, yeah. you know, but you would need to go through it because you need to go through all the areas. And that's why he says uh, in the Mishnah Torah later on that the, um, that most people can't do that, which is why he wrote the Mishnah Torah. Yeah. yeah. But if you could, you it sounds like if you could, so I think the way the, the cheeky way to put it is like, the Raman would say, if you are capable of writing your own Mishnah Torah, that's what you should do. You know, meaning if you could go through all the sugyas the way he did and arrive at the practical halacha, then that's what you should do. But the goal would be to arrive at the practical halacha, not to just be involved in, in theoretics as though that's like, a, uh, you know, an expertise on its own. Yeah. Isaac, did you ask me to repeat that because you had a follow up or you just wanted to hear what I said uh, before? I wanted, to, I wanted to hear it more in depth because I... Had you ever seen this I, letter, by the way? Uh, what did you say? Had you ever seen this letter? I have not. Yeah, it's pr pretty radical sounding, right? Yeah, I was actually... Um, <laughs> recently, in my chavrusa with my dad when we were doing the Harris of Rishurion, um came to this realization that, like, I think this is what he holds as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah now, and that, like, the whole... What did you say? No, go ahead. Um, like the whole um, recording, Machlo like the re he said, the reason why they, the Gemara records Machlokas is only so that you know, um, like when. So, um, so that way, if you hear the dissenting opinion that we don't poskin like, this way you know that 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 was a thing that was like considered and rejected. So yeah. you don't think that maybe the halacha is like that. Right. But. Um, like let's say you have Rabbi Huda who argues with the Chum and we're passing by the the Chum and the only reason that, that Rabbi Huda is still recorded is just so that so if you hear anonymously um, Rabbi Huda's position, then you can say, oh, like, it sounds like you're, what you're saying is Rabbi Huda's position and that's rejected. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that, that does sound like it's wrong. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I, I should have yeah. two caveats here. One is... Uh, One's minor, which is that, um, remember, this is one of the Ramam statements of purpose, and we need to put it together. Like, we would need to look at all of them. And, like, there are other places where the Ramam, you know, says that, like, I'm not trying to do away with the Talmud, you know. Um, and, you know, we have to take everything together. But then the second is, it is also possible that, you know, the nature and purpose of Talmud Torah has shifted throughout the ages based on the needs of the Jewish people. Like, let's say, for example, you know, uh, when everything was Baal Peh, so a lot of the way that we approached Talmud Torah was to facilitate the accurate transmission of everything, transmission of everything Baal Peh. And then once it became put down in writing with the writing of the Mishnah, um, then, uh, then, uh, then that changed somewhat uh, in terms of uh, that urgency wasn't there anymore. And let's say, for example, you know, before um, there were halakhic codes, 
then the only way you would get psaq would be to learn through all the sogis and arrive at psaq on your own or to depend on someone who's doing that. Whereas once the code started, came into being, then practical halakha became somewhat divorced from the theoretical study. So it's possible that now there's some other way that we relate to Talmud Torah where the shakh levitaria becomes more prominent and more necessary. Like, for example, I'm just going to make something up here. Like, maybe one could argue that, you know, in the Ramam's time when there weren't codes, then you'd be wasting your time if you spend your time on the Shach Levitaria. But now that you can look up in the Shulchan Aruch and look up what the Tzach is, so maybe that expertise is like a luxury that we can engage in now because we know we have what to do with the practical halacha. And why would you turn away from the Ava Hashem that you can get from studying the Chachmas of Talmud, you know? Like, is what the Ram saying to Rav Yosef, would he say that today? And I don't have an answer to that. Well, I mean, um, if you were to ask someone how to, how, like, how to figure out halacha today, they'd say you have to look at, at, at all, all the discussion from the Rishonim and the Achronim on it. Um, right. Which does not sound, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Which, uh, yeah. Yeah, and so in terms of, like, figuring out that, then, like, um, then going back to the Gemara would be even more of an issue because then you have to do the Gemara and all of those things as opposed to just doing the Gemara. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it it's, seems the, to be even corpus, more true. The corpus of text is a lot bigger and uh, and the gap would be much wider in terms of like how far you're going off of the main purpose. Um, I, I'm looking at my phone now. Uh, my brother Johnny told me that Rav Schechter came out with a statement like this recently and he sent me the statement but I didn't read it yet. Uh, so let me just look for it really quickly, and if I can find it, then we'll read it for the first time together. Uh, because if it's on this topic, then that'd be interesting to see what someone who who is intimately familiar with the brisker deraf, you know, uh, and who's like a, a gadol hador, what, what he says. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Oh, here we go. So this is the statement. Okay, it's not very long. So he said. So again, this is the first time I'm reading this here. Um, oh, you know what? I'll do. Hold on. Let me just uh, copy the link, send it to myself and then open it on the screen so that other people can see it. Right. Um, sure. Okay. Paste, send, uh, and let me get it here. Hey. It's a living Isaac. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Stop sharing, hold on. Uh, let me just send this to uh, Zev. Yeah, okay, sending it now. All right, so I haven't read this yet. Hopefully it's relevant. It sounded relevant. Okay, so uh, he says as follows. So it's called Iker and Tafel and Learning. Do we know where this is published from? Nope. Uh, or when it was published? Nope. Okay, so he says, the Gemara uh, in the Darim 38a tells us that the original plan of the Rebona Shal Olam was that Moshe Rabbeinu would, would only tell the Jewish people the dinim of the Torah but Moshe could reserve the methods of the derivation of the dinim uh, pilpula, pilpula shel Torah exclusively for his own descendants. However, Moshe Bina was good-hearted, tov ayin, and therefore, I think that's good eyed, uh, and therefore shared everything with the Jewish people. Interesting. The Nitziv in his commentary on the Chumash suggests that this good-hearted act of Moshe Rabbeinu took place at the beginning of Chumash Devarim, the month before he passed away. The Midrash tells us that the Rivon Olam gave the Torah to the Jewish people in the desert instead of in Eretz Yisrael so that no individual Shevet would be able to claim that they are the Bali Batim over the Torah and should have the final say in the Pesach Halakha. Interesting. Had the Rivon Olam given the Torah to the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael, the Shevet that owned the part of Eretz Yisrael in which it was given would have claimed that they should have had the final say. Uh, therefore, the Torah was given in the desert, which did not belong to any of the Shvatim, in order that all the Jewish people would be entitled to an equal say when the Shilas came up. It would then seem, it would seem then, that according to the Nitzv suggestion that Moshe Rabbeinu shared Pilpula Shel Torah with everyone at the beginning of the Chumash Devarim, when the Jewish people were located in Eber Hayardin, the Shevet within whose share of Eber Hayardin this took place could claim that they should have the final say in the Pesach Halacha. However, the Nitzv explained, based on Midrashim, that the particular location in which Moshe Rabbeinu shared Pilpula Shel Torah with the Jewish people did not belong to any of the Shvatim at the time, thus avoiding the problem. Okay, great. The Gemara 13, uh, Irvin 13, two more paragraphs here, tell us that Rabbi Meir's style of teaching was that he would explain all the logical possibilities in Paskin and Mashayla. In the days of the Tanaim, that was not a popular style. Rather, the students preferred to listen to a shir where the Rebbe said what the din is and explain why the din should be so. They were not interested in hearing all the other logical possibilities. As such, many of the students left Rabbi Meir to learn in the yeshivos of the other Tanaim. 
In the next generation, when the Tanaim vowed, oh, sorry, voted to learn, so, let me start again. In the next generation, when the Tanaim voted how to paskin la halacha, Rabbi Meir's opinion was not accepted most of the time because he had he has fewer students than the others. We live in a generation where everything is upside down. Most of the students in most of the yeshivos are not at all interested in the bottom line psak halacha, and rather are only interested in the pilpula shel Torah. According to the original plan of Ribbon Shal Olam, the Pilpula Shal Torah was not going to be transmitted to all of Klal Yisrael. This modern style of emphasizing all the Svaros and all the logical possibilities is really a distortion of the basic mitzvah of Talmud Torah. According to the original plan, the Ikra of Limut Torah HaTorah was to be the Psach Halach Lamaisa regarding every detail of every mitzvah. Our style of emphasizing Svaros in all directions is to be compared to a person only eating a lot of desserts without eating the main nutritious part of the meal. Only after one already kn thoroughly knows all the data about the Chukim and the Mishpatim, it doesn't make sense to spend time on the Pilpul Rosh Torah. Interesting. So you can see why that might be relevant to what we're talking about now, right? I mean, it sounds like the view of Talmud Torah he's advocating is very similar or identical with that of the Rambam, uh, even though he's approaching it from a different direction, like from the Midrashim and such. Um, but, you know, we also have to realize that he might be using the term Svara equivocally here. You know, he says, he seems to... Uh, throw in Svara alongside logical possibilities, you know? And like, I can't speak for other yeshivas, certainly in this yeshiva, what we mean by Svara gives you insight into the Psach and therefore like, it's hard to argue that bypassing that would lead to a better understanding of the Psach you know? Right, but I guess he's finding that if you had all the facts, then you get a better response. Yes, and this is, that's the constant, that's the uh, perennial uh, debate of like, how much to focus on, uh, Sinai and Oker Harim and the Kiyos and Eon and, and yeah. Yeah, well, I think, uh, like, even with what you were saying, like, let's say there's, like, going in depth to figure out, um, like, let's say, um, let's say you're, you're looking at two possibilities and one of them, like, let's say this is focused in the Gemara and possibly one of the two things. Yeah. And you're trying to figure out the essence of the Gemara physics. Then that's helpful for figuring out the, the song. But if let's say you're, um, and, and, if, and if you're thinking about it, and, and if from there you're going to go further and then you do, and then figure out what the song like, is, then I don't think he's a dead, I don't think he's Right, like, I don't think so either, even right. Even you're also, let's say, considering other possibilities. Yeah. Um, like to help you refine the two, the two sides. Yeah. But if you're, um, just let's say, like focusing on you know how we and the this um in the abstract of then like of, of like like different possible ways you could think about this thing yeah but not with how it relates to practical lava um but then I think that that's what he was talking about. Yeah, and I'll show you, I'll tell you an extreme nafkamin of that. I remember in Yeshiva, I think this was in 2006 or 2007, in Rapesach's year, uh, someone who came to us from another Yeshiva asked a question. I don't know if he was asking it practically, uh, but he said, uh, I, I think his question was, would it be a good idea to go through and just define Habaminas? Hmm. You know, um, and I, I don't know where that's coming from, but like that would be the extreme nafkamina of like, if you view the essence uh, to be like appreciating logical possibilities. So then what's the difference between Havamina and Laskana? You know, but like if you're just going through to understand Havaminas, especially to the exclude, I don't know if he meant to the exclusion of Maskanas, like I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't quite get it. Um, but like, you know, even according to this framework, like, you know, the, the virtue in studying a Havamina is in order to better understand the Maskana. It's not because of the value of Havamina as a logical possibility per se is like something that we should uh, explore. I guess, like, intrinsically, there is no difference in how many Muscana just happens to be the Muscana to the consequence. So, in, intrinsically, in terms of as a Svara, then yeah. I think you're right. But in terms of in, in terms of its its role in the system, yeah. which I guess is not intrinsically, yeah, then, then yeah, then there's, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not, yeah. it's usually not really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, uh, interesting question. Now, I, I have a feeling that we're going to get more into this when we read the Hagdama to the Mishnah Torah itself. And I also have a feeling we're going to get more into this when we get to Hilko's Talmud Torah, when he defines what Talmud is, yeah. you know. Um, but I think this is good to have in the back of our minds now. Yeah. But just one more point about this. Yeah. Um, back when we had the, the head of the voting about things, um, like, they've had, when Mechlokas came up 
they discussed the different possibilities and then they wrote it. and then the one that they decided was the halacha and the one that they decided again even though it was a totally reason possibility before they voted it's now like nothing and you don't like you're not supposed to even like, teach it it's not what they mm -hmm. like, uh it's not like oh it's, since it's a valid like conceptual possibility then why aren't you teaching it Wait, so then what, what what were we talking about earlier then which ones were recorded to prevent oh, people when this oh okay I'm like, i see um, yeah they didn't record the no that's why that's why you don't have any muscle just for like like our ship in the beginning of the to like until you have been us and we've been working on for like five generations before hill like tons of denial and movies no recorded anywhere right. because they just they had, you know, they, whenever they had the stuff, they, they, from the focus, they, they voted on it and then they told one thing, which is the whole mm -hmm. Interesting. Wouldn't it help though for like the next generation when they're going to vote on it? Like, wouldn't it help the military's previous? Well, like, there was was if, they, so if they already knew what the whole was, then they wouldn't vote on it. It was if there was, like, if they, there were questions about what the whole was. Mm. That's when they have, you know. I also feel like I don't know if this is just imagination on my part, but I also feel like there's a uh, uh, there's a question of practicality of how much effort and time to devote to preserving those. It's kind of like saying, like we say, it wouldn't be helpful. It's let, okay. Um, actually, what, I'm going to go through the the dera. Uh, uh, let me. Yeah, I'll read them first. Okay, two. Uh, is we are not to include in this enumeration laws derived from scripture by way of the 13 exegetical principles by which the Torah is expounded or by the principle of inclusion, right? So not through the, the Mido Sertorn and Duress's ban. Three, we are not to include in this enumeration commandments which are not binding for all time. Four, we are not to include charges which cover the whole body of the commandments of the Torah. Five, the reason given for a commandment is not to be counted as a separate commandment. I think we understood all these yesterday. Six, where a commandment contains both a positive and a negative injunction, its two parts are to be counted separately, the one among the positive commandments and the other among the negative. Seven, the detailed laws of commandment are not to be counted among the commandments. Um, eight, so an example of that, so he says, um, uh, an example of this, Chalitza and Yibum are two commandments among the positive commandments. There's no controversy on this point. But when we study the laws of these two positive commandments and what is and what must be compiled, sorry, what must be complied with in accordance with the propositions of the law, it follows that some women perform chalitza and may not contract yibum. Others may contract uh, yibum and may not perform chalitza, while still others may do one or the other and others may do none of these two things. Same applies to men, that is brothers-in-law. Some submit to chalitza, but do not contract deliberate marriage. Others contract marriage, but do not submit to chalitza. Still others may do none and others may do either. Uh, contract the deliberate marriage or submit to chalitza. Okay, goes on and on and on. I think he's just gonna say, now, if we were to count each and every one of these laws as an independent commandment, the, tra the laws of tracted Yavamos alone would reach more than 200 commandments. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, yet there is not one among them that entails either a positive or negative commandment in itself. Instead, we are to say that these laws um, provide only that under certain conditions, this sister-in-law must perform chalitza or contract leverage marriage and under other uh, conditions, et cetera. Yeah, so just don't count it. halachos as mitzvos. Yeah. yeah. Okay, eight. Um, a mere, I think this is, the, yeah, this is the one that we didn't know. A mere negative statement excluding a particular case from the scope of a commandment is not to be included among the negative commandments. And he gives an example. Uh, he goes through a lot of Arabic stuff first. Then he gives an example. Uh, he says, oh, this is a, a funny word here in English. Okay, this really tickled my funny bone for some reason. Uh, I will explain this matter. The Lord has agreed that if a master smites, now how would you translate Evid Kana'ani? Canaanite servant. A Canaanitish. <laughs> Canaanitish bondman. <laughs> what makes, what's the, where's the ish come from? Is it because I maybe he's trying to say because it's not literally like Canaanite, like and he's trying to acknowledge that it's like a non Jew, it's an it's just a non Jewish Evid, but we call it Canaanite ish. Uh -huh. It's just very, I found that very funny. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so Lord is the Lord has decreed that if a master smites his Canaanite ish bondman or bondwoman and causes them the loss of any of their chief external organs, they go free. Hence, one might think that this law all the more applies to a Hebrew bondmaid. 
that if the master causes her the loss of one of her chief external organs, that she should go free. Therefore, he negated her from this law by saying, she shall not go out as the slaves do. As if he were saying, as if Hashem were saying, there is no obligation to let her go free in the case where he causes her the loss of one of her organs. Thus, the verse negates certain law from being applicable to her, but it is not a prohibition. So that's what he means. So, lo yitze, uh, I forgot the lo tete kitze avadim or whatever, even though it's expressed as she shall not go free, since it's just negating another law from her, we don't count it as a law. Okay, so like if you did this, my guess is you'd be violating, you know, maybe an institution of Evikanani, but you wouldn't be, there's no like separate law that you're violating from that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give us other examples here. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Um, hold on. He gives another example. Similarly, his words, they are not liable to death because she was not free, do not constitute an admonition, but a negation, saying in effect, they are not liable to the death penalty because her freedom was not complete. So just because a statement is made in the negative does not mean that it's a low sase. And he says at the very end uh, of the, not sorry, in the, in the middle, this is so long. There's no clear cut rule for distinguishing a negative statement from an admonition, except by the purport of the statement. There, there's no special word that differentiates the negation from the admonition since they are both expressed in the Hebrew by the same word, low. Wait, what's ad, what would be admonition? Uh, admonition, I think, is just the fancy English for low sase uh, or prohibition. I think it's a negative. Yeah, uh, I think admonition is like, you say, oh, uh, do this, but not as a commandment. I see. Like, let's say, um, like to compare two two things that are right, yeah, yeah. that are similar, but like to make similar lesson, but I think or one's example is negative. Uh, like let's say when it says that, that um for the case of Omi Makata, that you he can't send her out. Yeah. Um then like I think that's a lot. Um I think. Um as opposed to let's say when you sell a house in the wall city it says then it do, then it, it, it doesn't it doesn't go back. Mm -hmm. Um but that is like a is, is saying that there's a thing that does uh, like a phenomenon that doesn't happen as opposed to a an iser of doing so. So let me just actually look it up in in the Hebrew, mm -hmm. uh, just to see what it says here. Um, yeah. So he says. Yeah. So ashara is the word that they're using for admonition. Shlila is just a negation, like negating a law from her or from it in the case. I mean, like, don't do this. Right. So, like, in that case of she shall not go out as the slaves do is a Shlila, not an Azhara. I mean, she's still bound to it. Right. But, but the point he's making is that you don't count it as a Losase, even though Losases are phrased in that way also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the ninth principle. Uh, we also got this one last time. The enumeration is not to be based upon the number of times a particular negative or positive injunction is repeated in scripture, but instead is to be based upon the nature of the action prohibited or enjoined. So the more it appears, that does not increase the count. Right. Number 10, uh, acts prescribed as preliminary to the performance of a commandment are not to be counted, right? That was like the uh, bake the bake the lechem upon him. Um, uh, it does not count as its own mitzvah. Um, eleventh one is the different elements which go together to form one commandment are not to be counted separately. So the example he gives here is a good one is uh, you don't count each of the Arba Minim as its own commandment, even though they're all in, they're all ma'akev. Um, and that's, that's different from... Um, the details of the commandment are not? No. Um, when he said he was grouping the mitzvahs, there was... Um, there was Indian and there was Matara. Matara. Yeah. Matara is multiple mitzvahs that um, are each individual mitzvahs, but um, like relate to one another in a practical sense. As yeah. This, which is um, like multiple factors in a single. Yeah, um, indispensable components of one mitzvah. Yeah. yeah. Um, the twelfth principle. The successive stages in the performance of the commandment are not to be counted separately. So what was an example of that? Oh, that was the Mikdash one, uh, right? That you don't count all of the procedures of making stuff for Mikdash in, as one, uh, as, as individual mitzvahs. You just count Vazali Mikdash as one. The 13th. Uh, that is. These are like separate actions that all do one. Right. The other one is components, like uh, parts. 
I think. Uh, let me just give another example of the of the aluminum category. But also, how is it different than preparations? Right? Is that all part of the mix? yeah? Right, here's another example of the Lulav category. Uh, strictly similar, similar case. We are not to count uh, Hashem's statement concerning the, the Mitzorah that he be cleansed with two birds and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop and running water and an earthen vessel as six commandments. So there is the, there's like components, um, like ingredients, maybe a better right. word yeah, here. Yeah, you don't have to, like, even though they're all happy, you don't have them. Right. You're not like, you don't, like, you're not separate right. pieces. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, 13 is where a certain commandment has to be performed on more days than one. It is not to be counted once for each day. Right. So that, that we said, you don't have like a, a seven days of, of, of Pesach equals seven commandments. And then the 14th one, how the modes of punishment are to be counted as positive commandments. Right. So I think that's definitely what the Ramachita is that Din Skila, Din Strefa, Din Herig, Din Chenek. Are, are, are each of their own mitzvah. Um, and, and Malkus is another one. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we got most of them yesterday. Uh, is that the modes of punishment are each counted as their own mitzvah. Okay. Well, yeah. That is a very specific, that one. Very specific yeah. one, yeah. Okay, now, so the question is, so we said yesterday that the he seems to hold that if you don't understand what a mitzvah is, then that's going to warp your perception of the system as a whole. So I wanted to just, I, I feel like, I, I, I said this yesterday, but I feel like I wasn't clear about it, that I think according to the wrong, if you learn through each one of these, you'll find out some fundamental mistake about what a mitzvah is. And so two examples that left to mind, I think, that are really good are the first principle of not counting durabunans, right? So if you mix, so all durabunans have the character of, in some sense, being a getter, right? Rather, whether they're a getter for like um, preventing you from violating losase, or whether they're like a, a takana of like, you know, bringing out a certain idea, like amplifying it, let's say like a Shalosh Sudos on Shabbos, amplifying the, the concept of Onik Shabbos, you know, well, let's say like a Kriyas Megillah, you know, uh, uh, being a particular uh, instantiation or like a institution for Kiddush Hashem, you know, or whatever, right? Whatever you say it is. So if you mistake a getter for the Iker, that's a fundamental distinction. So if you've got a person who in their Minyan and Mitzvahs is counting all of the Gedarim, that leads to to a, a, a warped view of the system, and like the, that chazal that comes to mind is the um, the nachash. You know what I'm talking about with Chava? I mean, yeah, you know the event, but <laughs> you know the, the Rashi there. Yeah, like uh, he said, uh, just touch it. Yeah, let me just read it because someone told me I, I misquoted it, and I never verified that. Um, let's see. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, the dialogue goes, um, oh, sorry, uh, the Nachash says to the Isha, so he said to her, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the gun? Uh, the Nachash said to the, um, the, Isha, the Isha said to the Nachash, We can eat from any of the fruits of the tree, uh, from any tree of the garden, I mean, from any of the fruits of the trees of the garden. But from the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, do not, say, uh, God said, don't eat from it and don't touch it, lest you die. So Rashi, oh, was this what they said I misquoted? Did I claim that Rashi, no, 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 never mind, sorry. Yeah, he does say this. Okay, so, lo um, tigubo, so don't touch it. Hosifa al hatsivoy. She added to the tivoy. Yeah, that's what I misquoted. See, I always learned it that Adam made a getter and didn't tell her. Right. Oh, right. So I, I wonder if that is a different, uh, if there is a different version of the Midrash or not. Um, yeah, that's why she came to uh, degradation. And then he, he pushes her against it, right? And says, oh, you didn't die there. Then, uh, you know, you're not going to die if you eat it. Yeah, that's why it didn't make sense to me. I think that's why I assumed Adam told her because if she made it up on her own, then she would know that, like, she's not going to die. Well, so she, like, Unless she... Like, right, I guess in her mind, right. So either way, it, it filters down to this point, which is that if you're treating a getter 
for the thing as the thing itself. So that's going to lead you into a line of thinking where you think that there's a harm in violating the getter independently. And you're going to look then for like, you know, since the mitzvahs are for our perfection, you, whatever, well, <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk about that much more later on. So like, it, there's a very different thing where if you say that, that, that doing this action harms your perfection versus doing this action makes you prone to doing something else that will harm your perfection, you know? Um, so that's an example of like how this would lead to a massive view of the system. Right. Um, or like another good example of this is the, um, you don't count uh, something that's kolel, kolator, kula uh, as a mitzvah. So there, let's say you count a kadoshim tihiu, you know, or, uh, ulo, you know, uh, uh, serve Hashem. So there, it's like an uh, example Rav Pesach gave, not of this, but like a separate thing of how you have a speed limit and that says do not drive faster than you know, 60 miles per hour. But if you had a law that said be safe while driving, that's not a law, that's a general principle. And if you treat it like a law, that results in a very different system because then first of all, it's inherently more amorphous. You, know, you can't by definition codify it because it is a general principle. Yeah. And there's a certain absurdity, which like, uh, like an example would be if you go to a public pool and they have the pool rules. So, you know, no splashing, no running, no jumping, no diving, follow all the pool rules. There's an absurdity in counting in Taryag, something that includes all of Taryag. You know, like what is, I don't even know, those who do count it that way, I don't even know what they, what they hold about that. Um, and Need something specific in addition to like, what's it like? Like I say, like there's a thing you know, I mean, like go to the Fimashur or something. Yeah, 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 right, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that almost makes me, I mean, that makes me wonder, like, well, what, what is the Mahalogos then? Because if the Ramam is saying, we don't count it because it's Kola Kola Tora Kula, and they're saying, well, we're not trying to count Kola Kola Tora Kula. Yeah, Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I guess my question is, does anyone actually then disagree with these, with the statement? Like, does anyone count, you know, yeah, Ula of Do as, uh, as its own mitzvah? I mean, I, I don't know about the people beforehand. Is, is that yeah. Like um, so my theory is that if we went through all the 14, we would find something like this. The question is about the, the things that are technicalities, you know, that seem like technicalities. Like, it's hard to see how that would lead to a warped view of the mitzvah system. Like, like the punishments, yeah. Yeah, well, you see, even that I can understand, right? Like, let's take the punishments. That one actually is what I was thinking about that makes sense, is you could view a punishment as just a, a consequence of violating the law but that there's no independent significance to the punishment. Like there's no, it doesn't have the same character of mitzvah as something else. You know, it's just purely enforcing, you know, uh, but it actually does, you know, like, it, it, like the analogy would be like, if you, um, you know, no one in school, I don't think, thinks that detention has an analogy, a, a similar educational value as like a lesson, <laughs> you know? So, so it is a bit of a chiddush to say that the punishment has a mitzvah value, you know. Yeah. yeah. yeah I remember in Rabbi Yisrael when we did Sreifa. Yeah. Um, you burned like, someone's <laughs> throat, and yeah. 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 So we, um, like, when we were going through the team, it was like really interesting because it, like, we were like learning about how it's basically structured to teach you about like the type of of error that the person did because it's like has to be something where like. Like it's only certain that to be served gets like Yeah. Um, and he said that I, I don't know what they are, but he said that they're all like things where they're not like publicly known. And so the the way that spray is structured doesn't um is like like externally the person looks totally fine, except that they're uh-huh. not. <laughs> and, and like whatever, it was like yeah, there's like a whole thing about that. Like like you can't like force their mouth open in a way that's gonna like bruise that. Uh-huh, interesting. Because, yeah. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, 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 that's, a, that's a good example. Um, uh, another one that I'm thinking of uh, is, um, and maybe some of these are more psychological than like, uh, than like a shita, but treating the details of a mitzvah as a mitzvah, I feel like people do that all the time. Like they'll take one detail of a mitzvah and blow it up and make it into its own significant entity and not treat it as part of the rest of the system. Like, let's say for example, um, like, I mean, this is not an example of a Doraisa, but like saying Amen, 
right? Like they have like uh, allegedly they have like Amin parties, right? Of like going around like you know, uh, like trying to be more of Amin. Now certainly there are halachos about saying Amin and like all that stuff, but there's a, I feel like there's a, a loss of perspective that this is part of the institution of brachos derabanan, which is part of the institution of birkas mazan derisa, and like when you treat a uh, uh, one law as its own system almost, you lose sight of the place in Taryag, you know? Um, and so if, if, if you have Mone and who are going around like counting component, uh, you know, uh, individual laws as their own mitzvah, it, it, it you know, it, it leads to that kind of like psychological uh, um, diminishment or amplification. Um, I'm trying to think, of, there's gotta be other examples of this. Um, yeah. Well, if we think of them, we'll find them. And then similarly with like the, um, the component of a mitzvah counting, uh, uh, that's a similar psychological one. Like you could see someone, you know, let's, I don't know if people actually do this, but let's say like the Arbaminim, you know, of like venerating a particular min, you know, as not venerating as in worshiping, but like as in like endowing it with, a, with an intrinsic significance because it's indispensable. As opposed to recognize, no, the indispensable thing the, the, the intrinsic entity here is mitzvahs arba minim, you know, and this is a part of that. Um, yeah. So that's more psychological than like a shita, you know, type thing. Is, it, um, is that a thing that you've seen? That never... uh, I, I got to think through examples of that and, and, and see, but um, uh, yeah, that's just, that's just speculation right now. But that, that's, if I, if I, if I had learned the uh, Shurashim, that's, I think the way I would approach it based on what the Ramam said about the, uh, the Nivua from Yishayahu. Yeah. All right. So I guess uh, this is a good place to stop for today. Yeah. And then uh, we'll try tackling uh, B'Shem Adashem Kelol on uh, next time. All right. See you guys. All right. Yeah. All right.